Hi everyone and welcome to our event tonight. My name is Abby Endler with Penguin Random and I have just a couple of housekeeping items to touch on here before I turn things over to tonight's fantastic speakers. If you would like to submit questions for our speakers this evening, you can do so by utilizing the Q&A box, which you will see at the bottom of your screen. You can also upvote questions submitted by others within the Q&A box. You can activate the Zoom chat, which should also be at the bottom of your screen and comment along with the conversation conversation if you would like to do so. Now I'm going to briefly turn things over to Jen Childs from Penguin Random House Library Marketing before we introduce our speakers. Jen, if you could just come up on screen here, that would be great. Hi, Jen. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Absolutely. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, and again, I'm Jen Childs. I'm with Penguin Random House Library Marketing. I'm thrilled to open the Sure to Be Amazing event with a shout out to all the amazing libraries from Wisconsin that partnered with us to sponsor this evening, uh, 23 of them to be exact. Uh, we at Penguin Random House deeply appreciate their support of our books and authors and the support they give to readers everywhere. Especially during these trying times, libraries have remained a source of comfort, enjoyment, and community for us all. Uh, so a shout out back, please remember to support your library back. Um, I hope you enjoy tonight's event. Um, and another shout out for our website, barreadrepeat.com. Uh, there you'll get more reading recommendations and you'll also get registration information for future book and author events. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you so much, Jen, for all of your support for making this event possible. And again, just a huge thank you to all of the Wisconsin libraries that have co-sponsored tonight's event. Without further ado, I am going to ask our speakers to start their microphones and cameras and come onto the digital stage here. I am so delighted to introduce Lauren Fox, who earned her MFA from the University of Minnesota and is the author of the novels Days of Awe, Still Life with Husband, Hus and Friends Like Us. Her work has appeared in numerous publications including the New York Times, Marie Claire, Parenting, Psychology Today, The Rumpus, and Salon. She lives in Milwaukee with her husband and two daughters. Lauren will be discussing her brand new New York Times best-selling novel, Send For Me, tonight with Georgia Hunter. When Georgia Hunter was 15 years old, she learned that she came from a family of Holocaust survivors. Her novel, We Were the Lucky Ones, was born of her quest to uncover her family's staggering history. I know it's going to be a wonderful conversation between these two, so I'm going to turn things over to Lauren and Georgia. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Hi. Hello. Well, thank you, Abby and Jen, and thank you, oh my gosh, 23 libraries, Wisconsin libraries, incredible, what an effort, and, um, and a special thanks from me to Lauren for um, inviting me to be a part of your tour, I've been so excited for this, I wish it could be in person, but maybe, maybe for the paperback, in the meantime, yeah. we have people from all over joining us, and I'm so excited to talk about your book, oh my gosh, thank you, thank you. Thank you and so congratulations, much. the first, I mean, just what an amazing launch it's been for you. I mean, straight yes. to the New York Times, a book, a Jenna, read with Jenna book pick. New York, you're going to be on the Today Show in a couple of days. You guys have to all tune in and watch. Um, I just, it's so well deserved. And I just love this book so much. I got a um, chance to read an early copy and fell in love with it then. You have the most original and poetic prose and it just like sucks you right in and I picked it up over the weekend again just to kind of refresh and thought I might skim it and um and my husband kept being like where did you go are you sneak reading again and I <laughs> I had spent the whole weekend reading I couldn't put it down so for the last two days that's what I did I reread it and um it's just such a gorgeous and heartbreaking story and I can't wait to talk to you about it and I felt like for me, especially the second time around, I just was so drawn to the theme of love and especially that love between mothers and daughters. But before we go down that path, maybe since there are probably a lot of people, it's just brand new to shelves who haven't read it yet, maybe you could start by um, giving us a like, little quick synopsis of what the book is about. Sure, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much. I'm so, um, it's gonna be hard enough to talk about your book too during this conversation because um, George's book, We Were the Lucky Ones is, um, we, we discussed ahead of time how thematically connected they are. And I'm just so thrilled and honored that you're doing this with me. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, so my book, Send For Me, is about four generations of women and a family. It starts in Germany, um, kind of on the cusp of World War II, just as 
the tide of anti-Semitism is rising and it moves forward in time to present day Milwaukee. Um, it's about mothers and daughters. It's about um, the ones who were able to leave Germany and the ones who are left behind. And it's about, it's kind of about the stories that get passed down to us, um, not necessarily overtly, but sometimes as kind of complicated undercurrents, um, kind of about inherited trauma. And, but mostly it's about mothers and daughters and the bonds that connect us. That's uh, it, it, it all shines through. And I, I'm so excited to learn about your research process. I know for me, that was such a rewarding journey. And so maybe you can talk a little bit about about that. And I want to mention too, I know, I think this was in the materials uh, that you all were watching before, that will definitely be a chance for Q&A. So mm -hmm. write your questions down, submit them, and we will definitely have time. We're going to chat for like 20, 30 minutes, then we'll have time for Q&A. Mm -hmm. But I get to ask some questions first. <laughs> and so that's my first, I just would love to hear a little bit more about the journey of, can you talk about discovering that shoebox full of letters and what they were and kind of what that meant for you? And was that the first step in sort of in your own journey and where did that take you? Yeah, so this is 25 years ago now that I discovered these letters. My grandparents had been living with us in the years before they died. And um, after they died, all of their um, belongings from their apartment were in my parents' basement. And they were just there for a while. And um, one day I was going through them and I happened upon this little wooden box um, full of letters. You know, I feel like, I was thinking about this earlier today. There are few moments in our lives that I feel like we remember as just like still moments from a, almost from a movie. Like I have this such a vivid memory of discovering these letters and just, I didn't know what they were. They were in German and I don't speak German and they're in this old fashioned script that very few people can read. But when I found them, I just like, it was just this like as close as I've ever come to sort of a magical moment in my life. I just knew that they were something. I just knew that they were gonna be a key to unlock something and you know questions that I didn't have answers to or just sort of like that they were going to be um, a piece of a story that I was still learning. Um, so I found the letters and I um, I was a, a graduate student at the University of Minnesota at the time and I took them back with me and I, um, I tried to get them translated. It was hard to do because they were written in this unusual script but I found someone at the University of Minnesota who um, I thought he was just gonna have some suggestions for me but he he took it on as his own project. It was really lovely. It was a really amazing experience. Um, he, he himself had um, grown up in Berlin. He was half, his, his father was Jewish and he had passed in Berlin as non-Jewish and had, that's how he had survived the war. So he had a personal connection to, to the story. And so I would bring the letters to his office, a couple of letters every week and a little tape recorder because this was the 90s. And um, he would read them out loud. He would like translate them as he was reading them, read them in English and then into the tape recorder. And then I would take them home and transcribe them. And it took us about a year to translate them. So it was like this long unfolding story that I was learning, I almost felt like in real time. Like I still remember thinking, you know, every once in a while I'd, I'd walk back to my apartment and I'd half expect, I'd open my mailbox and I'd half expect to see a letter from my great grandmother. It was just like, it was surreal, was the traveling. experience. Yeah, I was time traveling, totally, yeah. That is just amazing. So it was the first step. Great, your great grandmother in Germany writing to your grandmother in, in Milwaukee, right? Oh, sorry, did I? Yeah, did I not yeah. specify that? Oh, but, you know, you yeah, might have. Yeah. But I so just want to clarify. And so, in it, and these letters over a whole year. I mean, I loved how you put. You, you talk about in your book. There's a quote where um, Claire, who is correct me if I want your generational counterpart, right? Right, right. And she's talking about how she discovers these letters. And she says the tone of them in the story feels both familiar and familial. Familial, and I mm -hmm. loved that. Um, and I just love. I, I did. You feel like you infused your story and your discoveries into that Claire's storyline of her narrative of what it felt like to be discovering this piece of her story. And I'm also curious how much you knew before and how much those letters sort of revealed to you. So. Um, obviously the book is fiction, but it, I have no problem identifying that like deep connections between, I mean, Claire is the closest, the character who closely resembles me. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that the experience of discovering those letters and the sort of like the emotional truth of it is it, how, it, how it unfolded for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and what was the second half of your question? <laughs> well, I'm just more curious, like 
I, 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 I love how you said that you, those letters, it was like, you were reading them real time and what you knew before, like for oh, me, right, right. I filled a huge gap in my family history in, in researching it. Was that a, a gap in you, in your family history? Did those letters fill a gap for you? Or was it more just this emotional, like, like you said, like stepping back in time to that, to that era and that time and allowing yourself to imagine what it felt like to be there? I think I know that for you, you had no idea that this was a part of your family's history, no. but I knew, I mean, I grew up with my grandparents and, you know, they, so they came from Germany in 1938 with my mom, who was a baby. So I knew like the outlines of the story. I, I mean, but they never really, so I've been thinking about this so much since the book was released and trying to remember what they told me and what I just pieced together and, you know, what my mom told me about, like, it really wasn't spoken about in my family, aside from the broadest outlines. I mean, you can't grow up with two people with super thick German accents and not know, you know, <laughs> that that's their story. <laughs> but yeah. I, and also the letters are not, the letters don't really tell a story that, you know, I, my great grandmother wasn't trying to tell a chronological story. She wasn't trying right. to tell a story at all. She was trying to get out of Germany and she was writing to her daughter and saying like, you forgot your coat and yeah. can you, uh -huh. you, the visas are all wrong. And so it was this sort of like, it was like she was dropping puzzle pieces, you know, she wasn't, there wasn't, it wasn't a particularly coherent story that she was telling, but it was a, it was like a, it was almost like a conversation. I mean, I love that you said it was like time traveling because it was almost like a, an ongoing conversation I was having with her and it filled in some of the blanks. And then, um, you know, I mean, I was able to get some, my mom, my mom was, you know, happy to talk to me about this history. My grandparents really weren't. So it was all kind of a, an yeah. ongoing process of um, like, like sketching out the story. Yeah. And so I read that you started by thinking about it potentially as a memoir and that yeah. didn't feel quite right. Like, what was that like right after you discovered the letters in your twenties? So, yeah. So I was getting my MFA at the University of Minnesota, like I said, and I, um, I knew that this was my project. Like I just knew that this was yeah my like creative, the creative project. I didn't know I'd spend 25 years on it, but I knew that it was, you know, <laughs> seminal for me. And um, I thought, you know, I, truth is so, there's so much in a world where there, where Holocaust denial exists, truth is, is crucial. And I felt like, okay, I have to tell the story. I have to be, I, it has to be a memoir, but I was 25 and I, you know, I didn't have that much to say. I didn't have, I wasn't, it wasn't really my, my genre and I wasn't, you know, I tried to sort of fill in the blanks of my great grandmother's story with like pieces of my life. But mm -hmm. I mean, it was my MFA, it was my, it ended up being my MFA thesis, but it didn't really gel. And so um, after I got my degree, I put it aside for a long time. And over the years, my husband would be like, you know, you should really go back to that. And I was like, no, you don't know me. I'm not doing that. <laughs> and, uh, but um, I think yeah, it, it was percolating <laughs> somewhere inside. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't leave me alone, you know, like uh, writers are obsessive. It was, yeah. it was there, you know, and it just, um, and then like the last four years um, have shown us that, well, you know, I started thinking about it when um, the Trump administration mm -hmm. instituted the Muslim ban and I thought, oh God, you know, this feels familiar. And then we were seeing images of families being separated at the border. I mean, history repeats itself. And so it became more, it became sort of, I feel like the story kind of reached like almost like a crisis point for me. And I felt like I had to return to it. And it just made sense. It took a few people in my life to say, you know, you've written three novels, maybe this is a novel. So yeah, I, can yeah. be a little, I can be a little thick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love, I mean, I, I love that you wrote it as historical fiction and um, you also kept the letters though exactly as they were, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, They're so I mean, I, They're so, I, I love that you did that. And I love knowing that as a reader, when you guys pick it up, just, it's, I just felt that we made it so powerful. Thanks. That was like sort of the, I, the promise I made to myself that the letters I was going to, you know, the letters were going to appear in the book word for word. I mean, I definitely, you know, sort of pried them apart and like rearranged some things and, but the all, every, I mean, I changed the names, but every, the, the letters are my great grandmother's words. That's amazing. And kind of going back to maybe that trigger inspiration of sort of it feeling more timely than ever, which is mm -hmm. scary, but so true. Um, do you feel like <laughs> living in this world that we live in with, with 
these Muslim bans and families torn apart at the borders and, and rising anti-Semitism and, and let alone the pandemic where we're all isolated and, and jobs and relationships and life is just completely upended has spending so much time in kind of the hearts and minds of, you know, imagining your ancestors and what it was like back then um, as they navigated, you know, through the Holocaust and uh, in their own isolation, has that helped you in any way or given you any perspective as, you know, in this crazy world that we live in today? Like, do you think about it often as you, as you tackle this, you know, pandemic and everything we're facing? I think, um, you know, you can't sort of help but feel like, okay, these people lived through something so much worse and they rose to the occasion because they had to. And so, you know, of course, to some extent, I feel like is connect. I mean, I the connection that I felt to my family story has been amplified and illuminated over the past year. You know, just because we're being called to isolate ourselves, and you know, there's so much chatter around us, and like so much politics involved in it, and it just feels like, okay, if they could do this, yeah, you know, of course we can too. And yeah, yeah I mean, I I had I had finished. I had written most of the book before the pandemic, but I was still doing the finishing touches and writing a few scenes you know, still back in April and it just felt like, oh, this is, you know, made more just like, it's just amplified. Yeah, it, it, in a way it's, yeah, you can understand, we'll never be able to understand, but in a sense you can um, with everything that's going around, going on around us today. So, um, and, I, and I definitely felt that and it gave me some pers that perspective and, and hope. And um, one of the things I loved the most about your book, um, kind of speaking to that, was you created this constant sense of conflict. So you had this impossible decision of Annalise, right, to, to leave her family behind um, for her safety, the safety of her, her own family. She leaves her parents behind. She's got this heartbreak that results. But you also had these incredibly beautiful moments, these tender human moments woven throughout as she watches her young daughter grow up, as she bakes apple cake, as she like dips her toes in, in the cold lake water. And they're just, your imagery is so gorgeous. And, and I just love that you, you know, allowed yourself both sides of that conflict. Um, I, I love this quote, Annalise's bird walking across a wire, unbelievable good fortune on one side, unfathomable heartbreak on the other. And then towards the end, how strange the convergences, darkness roaring into ordinary life. She is mute with sorrow and filled with tenderness for this undeserving world. So beautiful. So I'm curious, was that a conscious decision to juxtapose the horror and the beauty, the love and the longing to convey both sides? Or did that just kind of come naturally because it was part of the story so short answer yes it was a conscious decision and um <laughs> um somebody wrote I think this was a criticism of one of my earlier books but I took it as a compliment um somebody wrote that a novelist doesn't have any special insight that um but that a writer is just well me I think <laughs> they were talking about me just that just good at um observing details but not particularly like no like actual psychological acuity just like a really strong and I was like, yeah, that I feel like that I feel like that's you know that's that was sort of my project that's been my project all along just like building the world that we all like the, our worlds are just made up of these intimate specific concrete details and it's just like if you pay attention and you do that's what you see all around us just these like moments these like these nothing moments that just accumulate into our lives. And so that was what I was trying to, I mean, that was my project to sort of build the world out of these like tiny little moments. And I think partly to show just how much was lost. You did such a beautiful job of that. And it's, um, it's one of those, um, ways that we can connect and we feel so yeah. I mean there's so many parts of this story that we're like oh I've totally been there as that young, you know young mother or and, and which brings me to my next question um and compliment which is that you all you know you, you we often think about that era and holocaust era in black and white or these like sepia toned images kind of unfathomable statistics and yet you right. created this vividly colorful and nuanced um 
exp you know, experience, and we, which allows us to relate on a very personal level. And, and I mentioned before at its core, and, and you did too, it really felt like you almost sometimes forgot about the Holocaust and what was happening. It was just about this love that the mothers and daughters and this ancestral love passed down. And it's not, that also I loved, not perfect, right? It's often kind of agonizing between, between mothers and daughters. And I'll read one more of your passages that I thought was so beautiful. This is Annalise talking about them, her bond with her mother, Clara. She says, their connection is a deep and wordless blend of boiled potatoes and unsolicited advice a lullaby about a dog, a sick stomach gently rubbed in the middle of the night, an argument about a hat, vexation and resentment and warmth and need, a viscous flow of liquid, imperfect love. I just like, I almost cry reading that. I love that. Um, can you talk a little bit about that kind of theme of imperfect love? And again, maybe the inspiration from it, did that sort of just bubble up being inspired from your own family history? Or again, was that creative license or did it come out in your research or all of the above I'm, <laughs> I, I am all of them. <laughs> I think um so I feel like I have this sort of remarkably uncomplicated relationship with my own mom um we just take care of each other and um and my children will be in therapy in 20 years and they'll be like well we we don't have an uncomplicated relationship with you but I I feel like it's pretty smooth going I mean most of the time but I know that um my mom told me that my grandmother had a pretty complicated relationship with her mother, that, that her mother was just hard on her. And some of that came through in the letters. And so it was just sort of like, and I just, I, I had to, I do think I, part of the reason I couldn't write this when I was in my twenties was that um, I had to have my, I had to become a mother before I could really understand just like, not even the, well, partly the complicated love, but just like the, the daily mess of it, you know, I feel like I had to, I had to become a mother to understand the, 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 not just the daughter's perspective, but the mother's, you know, S apostrophe, the mother's perspectives throughout the novel. And, mm -hmm. you know, every day is just a new, like, every day as a mother is, you know, you have a three-year-old, so you probably know this more intimately than I do right now. Um, every day is just a new set of, like, sort of mundane challenges, you know? And so I felt like I was using all of that, like all of that muck and putting it into the story. So oh, it's beautiful muck. It really is. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll go with that. <laughs> um, I'm curious about, you have two teenage daughters, right? And yeah. you, you said they haven't been in school for a year. Holy cow. Right, right, right. That's another conversation, but. Um, <laughs> It's this, it you, is this conversation. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> How are you um, sharing? Have you already shared like what you learned? You know, obviously they they know what's going on. They're old enough and they yeah. studied the Holocaust. Like my kids are so much younger, but I'm just kind of curious about how you share this piece of your shared ancestry with your kids. Well, this partly, I mean, I was, this is the first time anyone has asked me that question. So this is, I'm just kind of formulating this as I, as I, tell you this but I think that was part of my motivation in writing the story um they're really close with my parents so I talk to my mom every day and um they know the story but my older daughter who's 18 um she, when the when the galleys came when the proofs came of the book she picked it up and started reading it I can barely tell the story without crying she just was she just burst into tears and she was like you mean they never do you mean she never saw her mother again and I feel like yeah you know, I, it was, I didn't know she didn't know that. Like, I, th I think she knew it, but I think reading the, reading the book helped her own that story, which was like a, an amazing and poignant moment for me. Um, they, and now I feel like, you know, I've written the book so they can read it and I can talk to them. You know, I, I never, I wasn't particularly, I didn't tell them the story, I, you know, but they knew it. They just kind of, you just like know the story through, in some ways through osmosis. I'm not even sure how they know the story, but they know it. And now they know more detail. Yes. And it will always be there and then for their kids yeah. and, and their kids and so on. And that's, that's gotta feel good. Um, so osmosis, did you get the baking? Is the, I'm assuming <laughs> your great grandmother, uh, and did they actually own a bakery? They, they did not. They owned a butcher <gasps> shop. A butcher and I was shop. like, <laughs> I've been a vegetarian since I was 16. And I was like, um, I'm not <laughs> setting this story in a butcher shop. <laughs> 
so just a bakery seemed like a much more pleasant place to go every day as I was writing this story. Oh my gosh, so. by the way, for those <laughs> listening, do not read this hungry. I don't even know what 99% of the things were that were you talked about. But you wanted it. Read, but I wanted all of it. It was my Me mouth too. was like salivating. Um, you know, my, my grandmother was an accomplished baker, but, um, you know, so I had a really visceral memory of like a lot of those good. pastries. And so that was really fun. And also it's so, the book was hard to write. Like it was an emotional, you know, it was cathartic and it was emotional and it was, it was draining. So it just was fun to write about a bakery yeah. instead of like the carnage of a, of a butcher shop. <laughs> I think that was the right call. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, I've gotten to know you a little bit and I can't wait to read some of your earlier books now that I'm a fan, but why, um, I, I'm curious because you're, you're the first, you have three other yeah. books, right? And I know you, you're really funny and you have like, I'm sure humor is like a big thread throughout your previous work. Um, did this one feel like you just mentioned it was a pretty significant emotional journey? Did this feel like a total departure as a writer just in your path your career path or were there things that you kind of drew upon from your first novels from your first books I mean I think my three other novels have been dark in their own ways you know they're about they're they're not they're not light they're you know one's about infidelity the other one's kind of about infidelity too and there's some infidelity in the third one and they're about <laughs> like you know they're all there's like a thread of of um sadness running through them and um, sort of gallows humor. And so I don't know, I feel like I understand that people have said, oh, this novel feels really different from your first three. It doesn't feel, I mean, it feels different to me, but it also feels like I'm kind of using, I'm using the same, I'm using the tools from the same toolbox, but maybe sort of, you know, using slightly, like highlighting slightly different things. But I feel like also writing the contemporary section of this novel, Claire's story, allowed me to like, crack it open a little bit and like breathe a little bit of humor into it so that was I hadn't written it the first draft did not include Claire's story and then my genius editor was like oh you need to you know this is only two-thirds of the way done and I was like you are wrong but she was of course right <laughs> so that was a that was kind of a breath of air into the novel yeah how great yeah uh, I I feel like uh I'm toying with the same sort of idea with what was with the my next one. And I, I am so excited about the idea of maybe stepping out of that past, that time traveling for a second. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine how probably satisfying that felt to be able to write mm -hmm. something kind of from your own heart, as opposed to imagining it from the heart of a, an ancestor or somebody who lived some 75 years before. Um, on the writing front, I feel like it's, I'm so fascinated by how all of us do it differently. <laughs> Like, do you have any, um, and also for any aspiring writers out there, any tips or best practices or what works for you? Are you like a morning writer or, a, um, I don't know, do you have any kind of like routines or practices that you rely upon to get your, I, I so want to ask you the same question. <laughs> like, that is, isn't that just like the most interesting question for writers, isn't it? I know. Um, <laughs> like, so much, I really want to know. know. <laughs> I, I, um, it's, you know, it's been a year since my kids were in school, so I don't really, I mean, I wrote diligently when they were in school from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, yeah, I don't, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm at best, at my best in the morning. Um, and I take notes like a maniac. I just, I really, really, I take a ton of notes. And then I have like these 200 page documents that are just full of notes. I'm like, what have yeah. I done? Uh, yeah. But um, yeah. I also feel like <laughs> you do, do you do the same thing? I do, the, I do that It's too. overwhelming. Yes. <laughs> and I think the, like the best tip I have is, this is going to sound so strange, but I, I really mean it. Like the best thing you can do, maybe especially now during the pandemic when our schedules are so sort of off the wall, is to really, really try to live as a writer, to just like be in the world. Um, it can be so easy to just kind of fall into the day-to-day, -day, just like the moment by moment, like domesticity or whatever else you do in your life, but to like pull back a little bit and observe and think like a writer. And, you know, who was it who said, um, it's all material. I don't necessarily think it's all material. Oh, it was, um, I can't remember. I'll remember it tonight and kick myself, yeah. but it was a famous writer who said it's all, it's all copy. Um, just to remember that like everything you observe and everything you experience has the potential to be, to, for you to write about it and for it to appear in your work. And so like, I think that's the best, that's like, that's the most significant um, part of my process right now since since my process has been upended by the pandemic is just to remember that I'm a writer and like to look at the world through a writer's eyes. 
Yeah, what do you, how about you? What do you do? Great <laughs> advice. Um, you know, same. And then I, yeah, my writing was upended for the several months when um, we lost our babysitter, but then she came back and I had a quiet <laughs> two hours a day again. And, um, and yeah, I feel like for me morning as well, I mean, it's probably the case for most, but I, I'm not like the 5am wake up person just it doesn't work with our daily schedule <laughs> or, or my body <laughs> schedule. Um, but I do feel like if I kind of think the night before, before I wrap up and walk into yeah. the chaos of mom life about what I want to do the next day, and then just sit down in the morning and do it. Mm-hmm. And like, mm-hmm. I don't like, I'm not psycho about turning off email and chat and stuff, mm-hmm. but like, I, I don't really care about that stuff in the morning. I feel like that's my precious time. And I have been thinking a little bit overnight and in the morning about what I want to get done in that first half of the day. And if it bleeds over to the end of the day, great. If I keep writing and writing, otherwise, if I try, give it a try 90 minutes, whatever. And, and I get my stuff out on a paper and then I'm happy. And then I feel like I'm going to editing or researching or trying to make sense of that document with a 200 pages of notes (laughs) but that that like taking it to the end of the day and like letting yourself sit with it like letting your unconscious work on it is really a huge part of it and I stole that tip from an author I did an event with a couple weeks ago Claire Pooley who wrote the authenticity project and I was like I'm I'm and I, I I've always been a morning writer but the thinking about it the night before it really made such a difference in my morning mm-hmm. routine mm-hmm. and my productivity so that was it was kind of, and you're so right. You just have to, there's so many other things we all could do. Um, and it's, it's thinking about yourself as like, oh, this, this is my, this is my, I am a writer and this is my time to do this and everything else can wait is equally as important. <laughs> yeah. And like, for, and also forgiving yourself too, because like, it's just yeah. been nearly impossible the last several months and, totally. you know, being your best self, um, you have to take into account what's going on around you. <laughs> like, none of us can be superheroes right now. <laughs> um, and also, and like quieting the voice. I was talking to um, a my British publisher and she was like, oh, complimenting a writer is like pouring water into an unplugged sink. Like, you know, just, and I was like, oh, you know, yeah, that's so true. Like you just, it's so hard to take criticism sticks and compliments don't. And, you know, just quieting the voice but it tells you you will never write another word and just you know yeah. really working hard to like tell yourself you actually are okay yes. oh, I know I told, you are more than okay and on that note <laughs> are you are you working on anything else is it too soon to ask or I'm you- taking notes I'm just taking a lot of notes right now do you Little like baby the- ideas yeah do you like the historical fiction now that you've like gone there or are you thinking you might continue down that path or just kind of see where it happens next I really liked writing historical fiction. I found that we didn't talk too much about research other than the personal research that I did, but like I, your book was so, I was amazed as I was reading it, but the, your book is so gorgeously researched and meticulously researched. And did you, I mean, I found that process kind of revelatory. Like I really never thought of myself as a historical novelist and I loved it. I, I agree. And I, and those are the details that that really, I think, bring the story to life for a reader too, right? The ones that really like Mm -hmm. put you in that place in time. I remember getting through with the, like kind of the bones of my story, the personal story of how my relatives managed to survive and thinking like, I did it. Like I figured it out. The narrative is there. And then it was like, oh, but all the connective tissue is not like (laughs) all the other, like whatever, what kind of trees were growing in Siberia and what kind of cigarettes did they smoke and crack up? Like all those things and- um, but that's so fun. <laughs> Maybe yeah, it's and when you nerdy, and when you just dis- so when you discover those little details, you're like, yeah, you know, the like the brand of toothpaste that she would have used in 1936. You're like, oh my god, it's that's what that was really. I hesitate to say fun because it was researching a really difficult time period, but it was. It was. It's totally fun. Yeah, it's totally fun. I I love that part too. Um, and did you have any books that you inspired you? Um, Favorite. Oh, yeah. Like a um, yeah. I really relied on a book called Between Dignity and Despair, um, mm-hmm. about specifically about German women in the late 1930s and just how the um, the Nazis squeezed German life because it was really different. It was a really different experience in Germany than it was in the rest of Europe. And the project, the Nazi project for a long time was to get all the Jews to leave, not to kill them. And then it shifted over. So like that, I really relied on... Um, that was a really important um, book for, that was a really important book for me that I relied on my 
the, my research really relied on that. So. Cool. Oh, okay. and also Nora Ephron is the one who said it's all copy. It came there you me. go. <laughs> I was like, I I could, nice, yeah. nice. Okay, I'm getting a note um, from Abby that we have some audience questions. All right, are you ready? Should we dive I'm in? I'm ready. Okay, first audience question. My awareness of family that survived did not and not and no one knowing what happened to others only became known 10 years ago. It seems that many Jewish families touched directly by the Holocaust experienced this silence decades after the fact. Could you comment on this phenomenon? Did you experience this? Do you know of others who have? Do you have an opinion why? Um, that's a good question, a good series of questions. I think um, the silence is, um, really common i think people who experience trauma are often inclined not to talk about it like just simply you know and especially that generation i think wanted to move forward and move on and like not inflict the next generation with it and um i think that was the case in my family and i i mean my grandparents were like these incredibly beautiful loving people i think they didn't want to burden us with this story but you know it it's still as we know, it still, it comes through in other ways. But I think that's a really common um, quality of people who, who survive trauma is to, um, I think it can go either way, actually. I think it can become something that they really want to talk about or something that they really don't want to talk about. Agreed. And I also think it's interesting how it's our generation that in many cases that be, enough time has passed, maybe skipped a generation or two um, that has either has the courage to ask the questions, we're distanced enough from it that it's not so raw. Right. Um, I mean, my family didn't really talk about it either. And our story had a very different ending, you know? So I, I think it's like th this um, listener said, very common. And, um, but I do think there's something said in the farther away we get. And sadly also those survivors, that population, soon will be gone. So I say, I feel a sense of urgency, but I think there's something about that third generation that kind of has that space. Yeah. Um, a lot of people ask my, my mom and her sister, Kathleen, who are both on here. Hi guys. Um, why, you know, what, what did, why didn't your parents tell you more? And it's the same thing. They're like, they told us little bits and pieces, but it was almost anecdotal. And it was, mm -hmm. we think a way of, of protecting. So I, I think that's definitely common. Okay, here we go. Congratulations on your new book. Can you talk about your writing process? What was the most challenging and or uplifting part of it? Um, well, also really good question. And um, I'm trying to just think about what part of my process I haven't already addressed, but the challenging and uplifting parts of the writing process are kind of one and the same. Just this was so, I really feel like I, even though the story is fiction, I really feel like I was able to sort of like put a, like a through line to the story that I didn't really know when I was growing up. And so that was really like, just like, that was really satisfying to me to be able to, to um, put the story together, to like read her letters and to think about what they were going through and to talk to my mom and ask her questions. Um, and it was also, so that was, that was both the most challenging and the most uplifting part of writing this story. I mean, in some ways I feel like I've exercised it in a way. Like it's weird not to live with, did you feel that after you were done with yours? It's weird not to live with it so intensely. Absolutely. Yeah, I do. I felt like, cause living with a story, you feel you're, you're living with those relatives. Like it's yeah, like, I, exactly. I came, came to know them in the process of researching it and, and imagine spending so much time traveling back and imagining what it was like to be there you almost just you come to know you come to know them and um yeah it's it is it's it's transformational um, and also just the like the psychology of inheriting in some ways this trauma even though we're both a, a good long generation removed from it just like trying to figure out trying to separate the story from yourself like I've been that's been like my life's work in a way and just so finishing this book has been kind of like oh, now what am I going to be obsessed about? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I completely hear you. I know people are like, what's next? I'm like, what do you mean what's next? That was like my everything. Yeah. I just put it <laughs> there was a quote from your book. You said, um, Claire, you're, who's the youngest uh, generational counterpart, says she's trying to explain to her 
boyfriend why she can't move to London. She said, I can't just leave them, meaning her family. We don't, we don't do that in my family. He could never really understand the primordial soup from which she had emerged. I love that. So it's like <laughs> trying to figure out that soup and like how it defines us and how it is a part of us. Yeah. Um, okay, a question from Lori. Do you have a special place to write? Maybe this should be like, have you had one in the last year? And before that, was there a different one? <laughs> we are lucky enough. We, have a, we live in a small bungalow, but it's got a lot of doors. So I'm lucky enough. Like what you see in my background is the neatest part of my office and everything. I, I half wish I could show you what is surrounding me, like the mess of my office, but it's my office. It's also where the kids come, like, and my daughter will come in after, like, and throw her clothes on the couch, and it's where they used to play, but it's my room, and I can close yeah. the door, so that's my my special place to write. Or a door is all you need. A door is oh. the whole. It's great. Yeah. Um, a question from Isabel. This might be my mom. How do you think your MFA influenced your writing? That is such a good question, and I almost don't know because... So I, got, so I got my MFA in 1998 and I really went into it just hoping for the time and space to and the funding to write, just to have no other worries. I was thinking about that earlier today, how I was making $9,000 a year and I was like, yes, I can live as a writer now. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, get, having that time and space though was phenomenal. Like, I mean, just not having, I, I was teaching but just not having another job and, you know, I didn't have kids yet and I wasn't married and just having no other responsibilities. So I don't know. I, I mean, I loved the classes and I loved my, my writing colleagues. I love like, I'm, they're still some of my best friends and best critique partners, but really like just having a couple of years when my only, the only thing I needed to do was write was the most valuable and influential part of my MFA. It sounds like heaven. It was. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. <laughs> I'm always looking into like writing workshops and some are, you know, like a one week here or there thing. So just, yeah. I'll take any, I take two days, 48 hours of just, um, and being surrounded by other writers. It, yeah. I thought it was really cool. Um, are you most comfortable writing in the present tense? I wondered the same thing. Julius knows he is tender hearted. It's an example. Um, I, yeah, I, I think that choice. I'm curious about that. I think it feels the most, I think it is the most immediate tense and it felt, it feels the most natural to me. I just wonder if that's like the, the time we live in and the, like, I don't know, I, it, even when I'm writing historical fiction, it seemed to, I seem to gravitate towards present tense. It seems like the most, it seems like the most detail oriented and maybe the least introspective. I don't know, but it works yeah. the best for me. Yeah, it's me too. And I remember like, it almost just, I don't even know if I made the decision consciously, just like, I just started writing that way. And then a lot of people ask the same question. We're like, but it's history. Like, did you think about writing it in the past tense? <laughs> and but it's um, not history when you're writing it. It's it's immediate no, when you're writing it. Happening right there. Yeah. yeah. I feel it feels I think it feels a little bit more more visceral that way. Yeah. Um okay. What was your great grandmother's background? Could you tell us a little bit more about her? So she, well, I don't, I mean, I only know <laughs> I only know what I know. I don't um that's kind of that was part of the that was part of the long project of this. I know she was, um, I think she was born in 1880, and um, you know my family goes way back. Um, there's some there's a member of the extended family who did like a bunch of genealogical research, and the, the that side of the family goes way back to like the 1700s or even earlier in Germany. Like I said, they owned a butcher shop. Um, she was you know hard on my grandma. <laughs> I don't know much more about her. She was. My name was Frida. Frida and, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot, what a lot of like, aside from her words, the character of Clara is, you know, fully from my imagination and like the conversation that I was having with her letters. Right. Because let's see, your parents, your mom wouldn't have remembered her. No, not at all. She was a baby. And stories passed down. Were there yeah. any like, yeah, it's interesting. Where do you, this is a big one. Where do you find your inspiration to write? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. <laughs> what is that? I mean, this one I was, you found it in that shoebox, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like um, sometimes the best writing is the one that's like, like you said, 
you couldn't ignore it. You know, even though you, you wrote it as a memoir, you, you found the shoe box, you were like, this is something I need to do. And then you wrote it and then you set it aside for 25 years, but it, it never stopped talking to you. I think you said it right. that way. I love that. Yeah. Um, like maybe inspiration, maybe I don't find inspiration. Maybe I just, maybe there are just things that like I'm constantly ruminating about and just like sort of gazing at the world and thinking and really I spend a lot of time like muttering to myself and like wandering around my house right I don't know <laughs> aside from finding those letters I've never had like a magical moment of you know like the light shining on me you know I just feel yeah. like it's maybe more of a maybe it's more of like a mundane craft than it is sort of like a moment of inspiration mm -hmm. but like a choice like look you can yeah that's I, yeah, I agree. I think, I mean, I'm thinking about that again, anything that's not the family story feels like, okay, this is a decision to write, not without sounding yeah. cheesy, a calling to write, you know? Right. <laughs> and then, yeah, it's your job. You take it every day. Um, okay. This might be tricky to do without spoilers, but if it's possible to speak to the end of the story, our few viewer viewers are curious to know why you chose to end the book the way you did. And if it's not possible to do that without spoilers, <laughs> then don't worry about it. Um, maybe you could even just, you could talk about the storyline you chose to end it with. I don't know, How do you, however you want to handle that. You can, you can pass if you want. <laughs> no, I don't want to pass, but um, I knew that the question of the ending would come up. Um, it always does because <laughs> it, it had to end, it had to end somewhere, right? Yeah. And I chose to end it, well, I ended it with Claire, the contemporary young woman in Wisconsin, um, kind of making a choice about how she was going to live her life. And it, to me, that maybe narcissistically, it felt like the culmination, I'm going to try to do this without spoilers, it felt like the culmination of the story, like how we carry the burden of the past and what we choose to do with it. And yeah. she, you know, um, her dilemma is whether to commit to a man who isn't, who is from England and whether, and you know, the, the, the question of geography and um, like leaving the, the decision, the complicated decision of whether or not she would be able to leave her parents behind kind of in a significant way. Um, so that just felt like, that just felt like where it all landed for me like all in some ways I think all roads led to that question like how do we reconcile history with our lives and how that? do you <laughs> that's great and I, I feel like I've been wanting to ask you all night like how how has this you know spending so much time with your own family story like how has that made you feel differently about moving? How, how have you reconciled? How do you feel like it was those quiet traits passed down to you that you're sort of just like more aware of now? Or do you make decisions differently? Like I have reconciled nothing. I am <laughs> not nearly as self-actualized as Claire. I live like five minutes from my parents. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I think it's just, it, it really is so interesting what we carry with us we're all, I mean, it's such a universal fascination, our ancestry, whatever it is. And then when you start to spend the amount of time that we've spent thinking about mm -hmm. it, um, for, for me, it was like things just like would pop up and sort of not necessarily like life changing for me, but just like, oh, that's why I'm like this, or that's right. why it was sort of just like, oh, or is it? I mean, yeah, I know. Where is it? Who knows? Who knows? It's so fascinating. Yeah, like maybe this book should have just been one page of me saying, like, I am just my I'm a mess and it's it's nobody's fault but mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like I um yeah, I don't I don't know. I really haven't I, I'm I'm getting ready to send my older daughter off to college. So like the new the like sense of maternal separation is, is like bubbling up to the surface again for me and I don't so I really don't know um you know what the answer is so like how we how we how we separate ourselves from our own particular histories or how we like let our children go yeah yeah oh god that gives me like a panic attack just thinking about <laughs> oh, like my oldest is nine um you have so many beautiful quotes um ugh about this, about this, like you know, be children of immigrants being anthropologists of our own families. We're participant observers of cultures we live in, but that will never quite belong to us. I love that. 
Um, okay, last audience question for both of us. What kind of notes do you typically take when you're just starting out with a new story idea? Is it research or just broad strokes of the new story concept? You wanna start? <laughs> broad strokes, just like the, you know, I just give myself the freedom to write down whatever garbage is in my brain. And sometimes that, well, so my other three novels haven't been historical fiction. So um, this is this process was new to me, but it's not, it has the note taking hasn't really involved research. It's just been sort of like this, like bleh, whatever, whatever <laughs> I'm thinking and you know, whatever just sort of needs to get out of my brain and um, onto the computer screen. So really like the, like sort of the gift of letting myself just write crap is maybe what my note taking is. I can kind of be like a little meticulous when I'm actually writing, but the preliminary note taking process is no holds barred. How about you? Yeah, that's awesome. Did you read um, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott? Like yeah. a little bit. I mean, there's a there's a there's a chapter on um, crappy first drafts. The real world word is different, but just her whole thing, just like get it out, get it out. Yeah. Don't judge it. Just put it on people. That's the most important part. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm only done this once and I'm now trying the second one. Um, feels very different. I guess it's I'm not the like. Oh, I'll just start writing and see what happens. I have to think about it for a long time. And, 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 yeah. and again, for the first, for we were the lucky ones, the plot was there. I just had to uncover it. So mm -hmm. it was just like, I felt like a detective or an excavator, like just trying to like pull the story, you know, together by flying around the world and interviewing relatives and looking at records and things. Um, but moving forward, yeah, it's been really interesting thinking about a second story and what it entails and and it's not based on my family history so I feel like that took a long time and I thought about it more in themes than I did plot if that makes sense yeah. so mother daughter, yeah. yeah ancestry and um but I but I feel like I am um once I get the sort of the big idea down I feel like I'm a little bit too type a to just start writing and and I think I <laughs> I, I start with an outline and chapter summaries and then, and then I veer from them. I don't hold myself so closely to them that they kind of hold me back, but I, I feel like I, so far, because my first one were lied, I needed that so badly. It was seven storylines and set, nice. you know, five continents in nine years. Like it was just too much to, to, for me to keep track of, let alone a reader. <laughs> so I, so um, I think I am now used to that idea of like, all right, let me start with a little outline and then take it chapter by chapter. Um, but the, yeah, the, the first stuff, the, like the inspiration is definitely thinking kind of big and messy and like, could we go here? Oh, that, that sounds, could we go there? I don't know. Does that sound right? Why? And I think the question uh, I ask myself a lot and my mother is such a great editor and she helps me with this a lot is why should we care? Like, why mm -hmm. should, why should a reader care? And if you, you don't care as the writer, that's going to shine through obviously. But, um, but I think that's a good one to ask as well. Yeah, you have to think about why the reader will want to turn the pages. I think about that all the time when I'm writing. Like, yeah. There has to be like a, but I also um, outline rigidly and then let myself yeah. stray from it. it. Makes me feel so good. Like, oh, I can see, you know, and then it's like, it ends up not adhering to that outline, but it's comforting to have. <laughs> totally. I feel like it's a start, it's like a foundation. And then maybe you can like expand and add some, you know, different rooms that you didn't expect to be in there, but um, it's it's a comfort place for me too, for sure. Because <laughs> I wrote a draft of a book between my first and second novel and I was pregnant with my second daughter and I did, was like, I don't need to outline. And all they did was sit around talking about how tired they were. <laughs> so that's <laughs> on the <a> novel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, here's Abby. Are we Hi, everyone. Hi. We are just about out of time here. Thank you both so much. This was such a wonderful conversation. I feel like I could have listened to you two chat for like the rest of the night here. Thank you both so much. And I just also wanted to give a huge thank you to everyone who tuned in this evening to Penguin Random House Library Marketing and to all of our amazing Wisconsin Library co-sponsors for making this virtual event possible. So if you guys have any last words, you're welcome to chime in now, but otherwise I think we are all set here and just want to thank everyone so much again. Thank you so much, Georgia, you are amazing. Thank you, this was oh. really fun. Thank you so much. This has been a highlight. I love, I looked forward to this so much. I knew it would be a fun <laughs> conversation and I really just, this is just, it's such a remarkable book. Read it, Thanks. everybody. It's so good, <laughs> it's so beautiful. And I'm so excited to see where it takes you. and. 
Thank you. Good luck on the Today Show. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, library. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us. Thank you.